Sup, Chooms? How y'all living? Hope everybody gets Nova and you're all having a preem week. As for me, I'm feeling a little under the weather right now, and no, it is not the coof, even though I know some of you Chooms would think that was hilarious. No, I just have a pretty bad case of the cold, so I have this warm cup of lemon tea to help me get through the video. There you can see it's the Cyberpunk 2077 mug. On the back it says, Welcome to Night City. So this is a pretty cool mug, but let me take a sip of it before I continue. Oh man, that's refreshing. So, anyways... If you guys have been following my channel for a while, you may have noticed that I talk about a lot of upcoming hair loss treatments in the pipeline. In fact, I can safely say it is my favorite subject to cover by far. As excited and optimistic as I may be about upcoming treatments like GT20029, the wind pathway drugs, pyrolutamide, and all the many others I've talked about, they all sadly have one common limitation, and that is of course the fact that none of them are actually full-blown cures for androgenic alopecia. Sure, maybe they can treat androgenic alopecia, but even if these drugs can get our hair loss completely under control, they will never change the fact that we all still have androgenic alopecia and we will have to keep on using these drugs indefinitely if we want them to keep on working. <clears throat> And that is simply because, as the name would imply, androgenic alopecia is linked to our genes. I've heard people jokingly say things like, How in the hell is it that we managed to send people to the moon and probes to Mars, yet we still haven't figured out how to regrow our hair on our scalp and stop hair loss? Well, believe me, I understand the frustration, but it turns out there is a simple answer to that question. It is because fixing a problem that is linked directly to our genetics is no easy feat. For decades, gene editing has been relegated strictly to the realm of science fiction and has been a major theme in science fiction stories and movies like Jurassic Park and Gattaca. Because of this, many people get the impression that gene editing is something that will only be available in the distant future and therefore it is pretty hard to get excited about something like that. But on the contrary, I beg to differ because this treatment is closer than we realize. In fact, even now we have the ability to actually edit the genes in our body. We can destroy genes that cause diseases or fix genes that are defective. The most exciting thing about this is that when the genes are edited, the changes are permanent. That's right, we're talking about permanent cures for all sorts of genetic diseases that are on the horizon, and guess what, Chooms? One of those potentially curable genetic diseases is the slaphead curse, which is also known as androgenic alopecia. First off, though, how does gene editing work exactly? Well, maybe some of you guys have heard about CRISPR. That's C-R-I-S-P-R. -S CRISPR, what it stands for, is cluster regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats. Well, that sure explains everything, doesn't it? Okay, let's try to get beyond the medical jargon here. This little video that I got from the CRISPR website shows how it works, so let's go ahead and watch it. The system is comprised of two parts, Cas9, an enzyme that cuts DNA, and a guide RNA whose sequence directs Cas9 to a specific location in the DNA where the edit should be made. Cas9 associates with the guide RNA to form a complex that can be easily and precisely targeted to a desired site in the DNA. The CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing process begins when the complex recognizes and binds to a short segment of DNA adjacent to the target site. This initiates unwinding of the DNA helix, which allows the guide RNA to pair with a specific target sequence in the DNA. If the sequences pair precisely, Cas9 cuts the DNA, forming a double-strand break. A larger fragment of DNA can also be removed by using two different guide RNAs to target separate sites on either side of the desired deletion. Cleavage occurs at each site, and the repair process joins the separate ends, thereby deleting the intervening sequence. Corrections to DNA can also be made by adding a DNA template along with a Cas9 guide RNA complex. The template is designed with sequences that exactly match the DNA adjacent to the target cut site. Through a process called homology-directed repair, the cell uses the template to repair the break, thereby replacing the faulty DNA sequence or even inserting a new gene. So in that video, you see that CRISPR works by loading up a protein called Cas9 with some RNA. The RNA is designed to match a target in the DNA sequence of the gene that we are trying to edit. The CRISPR technique can cut genes into pieces, which inactivates them, or can even fix a defective gene by inserting a new DNA segment into the gene. So... 
This technique is already being applied to cure human genetic diseases. In fact, the New England Journal of Medicine published a report on six patients with a rare genetic disease called transthyroidin amyloidosis who were treated with CRISPR gene editing. The abnormal protein that causes this disease was markedly reduced after several doses of a CRISPR drug called NTLA-2001. The authors of the study feel that this type of treatment can even be a permanent cure. They say, quote, on the basis of data in animals, NTLA-2001 may be able to produce a nearly complete and permanent knockdown of TTR expression with a single administration, unquote. Well, that's all fine and dandy, but can these gene editing techniques also be applied to hair loss? And specifically, can they be applied to androgenic alopecia? Can we edit the genes that cause the slap head curse and cure it once and for all? Well, surprisingly, the answer is a resounding yes, we can. Now, I'm sure someone listening to this is about to write the comments comment section, but Kevin, you said androgenic alopecia is caused by hundreds of different genes. Are we supposed to modify all these genes to cure hair loss? How could that possibly work, bro? Well, you can kind of think of it like playing Doom, where you have to choose your targets carefully. Sure, you could try to attack the Cyber Demon first, but if you don't take out the Barons of Hell and Arachnotrons beforehand, then you could end up getting overwhelmed and end up with a rocket launcher to your face. The same thing applies to targeting our genes. For example, you could destroy the genes for the androreceptors of the hair follicles. However, if your treatment goes systemic, then you would get into a lot of trouble because without androgen receptors, testosterone would have no effect on you and you would end up looking like Caitlyn Jenner or Jason Blaha. So a much better strategy here is to have gene editing fight hair loss the same way a drug like finasteride does. Have it so it targets the same trash enzyme that finasteride targets, which is the 5AR type 2 isoenzyme, which we know is the last boss of hair loss sufferers since it is the enzyme that creates the trash hormone DHT in the hair follicles that turns us all into slapheads if we give it enough time to do that. Now, finasteride predominantly blocks the type 2 5AR isoenzyme, but it does have some very minor effects on the 5AR type 1 isoenzyme and possibly the 5AR type 3 isoenzyme as well. And if you want to know more about these 5AR isoenzymes, you should watch my recent video on that subject that I'll link below. But to keep things simple, all you need to know is that it is a type 2 5AR enzyme that causes causes all the problems, and the others are not known to play a role in hair loss, so you don't really need to worry about them. CRISPR, though, is more specific than finasteride or dutasteride, because unlike those drugs that have at least some effects on multiple 5AR enzymes, CRISPR, on the other hand, can target precisely only the type 2 5AR isoenzyme, and could even permanently inactivate it. If you could do that specifically in the hair follicles, you would essentially have a permanent cure for androgenic alopecia. There would be no need to use drugs or any other treatment ever again, since you would effectively no longer have androgenic alopecia. Now, I know what you're all probably thinking right now, but Kevin, this has got to be like 20 years away at least. My hair doesn't have time for that, bro. Well, believe it or not, Chooms, this treatment isn't just speculative. It is already being done, at least in rodents, which is preliminary, but it is still a start. This research is being done by a Dr. Ru, who's from the hair loss research capital of the world, Good Korea. In 2020, Dr. Ru published this study titled, quote, Ultrasound Activated Particles as CRISPR-Cas9 Delivery System for Androgenic Alopecia Therapy, unquote. In this study, Dr. Ru and his good Korean research team pointed out that CRISPR technology to get rid of 5AR type 2 isoenzyme already exists. It is possible to create what's called a CRISPR-Cas9 complex like we showed in the video. This complex is made up of a protein called Cas9 that is attached to a guiding fragment of RNA that specifically attaches to the type 2 5AR enzyme. The problem is finding out how to get this CRISPR-Cas9 complex into the hair follicles because the complex is rapidly degraded in the tissues, and also because the stratum corneum, which is the protective layer of the skin, is difficult to penetrate. So, in this paper, the researchers found a way to enclose the CRISPR gene editing complex in a type of nanoparticle called a nanoliposome. However, to keep this nanoliposome from going systemic, they also created a form of microbubbles, and these nanoliposomes contained the CRISPR complex attached to these microbubbles. The exact details of how they created this nanoliposome microbubble complex, which the investigators call a NLMB complex, are outlined in this figure right here. This other figure shows what the 
the nanoliposomes, the microbubbles, and the NLMB complex look like under an electron microscope. The process is pretty technical, but the details aren't too important. What is important is that the process is feasible and it works as expected. The other important thing is that these NLMB complexes are very large, so they can't by themselves penetrate into the tissues or the bloodstream and go systemic. However, that's a problem because that means they can't penetrate into the hair follicle cells either. So one more step is necessary. That step is to apply high intensity ultrasound to the scalp. This causes what's called sonoperation in the cell membranes. What happens is that under the influence of ultrasound, the microbubbles collapse and cause pores or holes to form in the cell membrane. The nanoliposomes containing the CRISPR genes then enter into the interior of the cells. Inside the cells, the nanoliposomes burst and then release the gene editing apparatus so it can go ahead and do its thing, meaning it can go ahead and knock out the type 2 5AR gene, which is known as SRD5AR2 gene. The beauty of this technique is that the ultrasound can be adjusted to just affect the scalp. So only the skin in the scalp is affected by the gene editing, which means that there would be no effect anywhere else in the entire body. And even better, the dermal papilla cells contain a form of stem cell. So if you edit those stem cells, all future generations of dermal papilla cells will have the edited genes. That's why I said this could actually be a permanent cure for androgenic alopecia. So what were the effects of these CRISPR nanoparticles on the hair follicles in the study? Well, first of all, the investigators showed that ultrasound was indeed able to cause the nanoparticles to release the CRISPR into the cells. This figure here shows that CRISPR, which is stained green inside cultured human dermal papilla cells after the nanoparticles, were activated using ultrasound. The next figure shows the suppression of the SRD5A2 protein, which is the type 2 5 air enzyme when different concentrations of the nanoparticles were mixed with the hair follicle cells. So, after these cells underwent gene editing, the authors looked at the evidence that DHT was no longer being produced when the cells were given testosterone. Normally, hair follicle cells convert testosterone into the trash hormone DHT using the type 2 5 air enzyme. This leads to activation of the androgen receptors in the cells, which then leads to many destructive downstream effects, and if the levels of DHT are high enough, the hair follicle cells actually die, which is why we go bald. However, gene editing prevented this process. As the authors of the study say, quote, from the results, DHT was effectively inhibited by the disruption of the SRD5A2, the type 2 5 air enzyme, thereby ensuring cell survival, unquote. The researchers also found that there were no significant off-targets in the cells, meaning the CRISPR just affected the type 2 5 air isoenzyme and nothing else. The researchers then conclude, quote, the selected signal RNA specifically recognized the SRD5A2 gene and expertly edited the target site, unquote. So after doing these in vitro studies, the investigators decided to try these nanoparticles out on shaved mice. The mice were shaved when they were seven weeks old and all their hair was in the telogen resting phase. You see, in mice, unlike in human beings, the hair cycle is synchronized, so all the hairs are in the same phase at once. In human beings, the hair phases are random. Anyways, these shaved mice had testosterone applied directly to their backs every day, which produces DHT and inhibits hair growth. So this is a similar model to androgen alopecia in humans. The nanoparticle solution was applied daily for just five days along with ultrasound, and then the mice were followed for seven weeks to see if their hair would regrow. The investigators used different control groups. One group of mice didn't get any testosterone or any treatment at all. Other groups got various combinations of the nanoliposomes, the microbubbles, the NLMB complexes with and without the active CRISPR inside, and all these were given with and without applying ultrasound. So there's a lot of different groups we're talking about here, but the results after seven weeks of treatment are shown in this figure right here. The mouse at the top left was shaved, but then got no testosterone or treatment, and all his hair grew back in seven weeks. All the other mice had testosterone applied to their backs, and all these received the different combinations of treatment I just mentioned. Obviously, the only thing that worked was what was used on the mouse in the lower right corner. That was a mouse that received the CRISPR complex encased in the nanoliposome microbubble complex that was activated by ultrasound. That mouse had 90% recovery of hair growth compared to the control mouse, and hairs were in the antigen growth phase as opposed to the other mice who received testosterone where the hairs just stayed in the telogen resting phase. Well, 
They next analyzed the skin of these treated mice and found that the NLMB activated by ultrasound penetrated the skin and entered the dermal papilla cells. There was a 70% reduction in the 5 air enzyme in the mice treated with the nanoparticles, which you can see in this graph here, where the bottom pink line is the active treatment. The researchers found that, quote, Western blotting showed that the expression of the SRD5A2 protein significantly reduced due to the edited SRD5A2, unquote. The researchers also looked at the other mouse organs to make sure that there was no effect on these organs. They found no effect on the 5AR type 2 enzymes in these other organs at all. Now, the investigators didn't do any long-term studies on these mice, but theoretically, once these genes are edited, they would pass these edited genes along to the descendants of these hair follicle dermal papilla cells. So gene editing, unlike every other hair loss treatment I've ever talked about on this channel, could be completely permanent, which would make it by far the best hair loss treatment been ever imagined. Calling it a treatment doesn't even do it justice. No, this is a full-blown cure because the outcome is no more androgenic alopecia. Your scalp will basically be the same as someone who didn't in inherit the androgenic alopecia gene. Imagine a dermatologist applying some stuff to your hair daily just for a week or so along with ultrasound and then you never have to worry about your hair ever again. That's how good this treatment really could be. This stuff reduces the type 2 5 air enzyme by 70% in the scalp which is more than 1 milligram daily of finasteride or 0.5 milligrams daily of dutasteride, which suppresses it by 50%. Literally, the only thing out there that can be used safely that rivals it at the moment is 2.5 milligrams of dutasteride daily, since that suppresses scalp DHT by about 80%. But if the effect is truly limited to just the scalp as it appears to be, then there would be no more worries about any side effects. There would be no effect on the type 2 5 air isoenzyme anywhere else in the body. No effect at all on the type 1 or type 3 5 air isoenzymes. So there Therefore, there would be no more lame excuses to not start treatment, saying things like you can't use finasteride because of my neurosteroids, even though it is worth mentioning that the whole finasteride and neurosteroid thing is complete bullshit, and I'll post my video series below explaining exactly why. So literally all you would be doing with this treatment is creating a permanent genetic change to target 5A activity in the scalp more potently than any drug could even dream of doing, and in a way that works locally so there's no chance of any side effects, even though the chances of side effects from 5-air inhibitors is already very low to begin with. In addition, there's every reason to believe this effect could be permanent. So this all sounds great, but how close is this treatment exactly? Well, the next step here would be to do human studies, and as this mouse study is already three years old, I'd be surprised if preliminary human studies aren't already in the works. However, as gene editing is just entering the mainstream, I wouldn't be surprised if there weren't some snags because of ethical and political concerns. People already freaked out beyond belief about about mRNA vaccines permanently changing their DNA, which of course is impossible and preposterous, so it makes me wonder how they will respond to treatments that intentionally alter their genes. I think the science is advancing quickly, and we could see some viable gene editing treatment for androgenic alopecia in just a few years, unless politics gets involved like it did when George W. Bush banned stem cell research. In fact, the whole debate really reminds me of this amazing video game called Deus Ex Mankind Divided, which was the last game released in the critically acclaimed Deus Ex series. The game is set in this hypothetical near future where people use mechanically augmented limbs and organs to give themselves an edge over their biological counterparts. Although successful, this nevertheless results in resentment and persecution against mechanically augmented people with lots of allegory towards real-life accounts of historical discrimination like apartheid and Jim Crow. There are even separate public facilities like restrooms and public transportation specifically for augmented versus non-augmented people, for instance. It sounds far-fetched, but I could potentially see something similarly happening with gene editing where people who elect to undergo gene therapy are derided as defiling the sanctity of the human organism or that gene editing is a part of a scheme to strip us of our humanity and turn us into a slave race for our reptilian overlords from Proxima Centauri. We're living in the era of contrarianism and conspiracy theorists, so no doubt there will be some backlash against gene editing from those who wish to stand in the way of science, but as Adam Jensen once famously said, you can't can't kill progress. See you next time, Hair Loss Witchers. God bless.